Hello and welcome to this video lesson on the poem Poppies by Jane Weir. I'm going to run through basic background information for it, then I'll actually read the poem itself, then we'll go through it to make it a bit clearer. Finally, we'll move on to themes and analysis. So, Poppies. It was written in 2009 by Jane Weir. She was asked to contribute to a new collection of poems that which would explore war. Poppies is a dramatic monologue, meaning that it's spoken in first person by a mother who is struggling to deal with her son leaving to join the military. Just to be clear, that isn't Jane Weir herself. She was writing as a character, so the speaker is a, a made-up character, a mother, who isn't real. But she could represent any mother, because although this is a modern poem, it could actually represent anyone at any time. Weir said that she was inspired by the thought of mothers and soldiers and how they must feel. So it begins three days before Armistice Sunday. So Armistice Day is the 11th of November, you probably know about it already, held every year to remember the formal agreement between the Allies and the Germans to stop fighting during World War I. Remembrance Sunday recognises those who have died in all wars now, and it's held obviously on the Sunday after. Armistice Day. Poppies grew on Flanders fields in Belgium and France, and, and this is the place where a lot, many soldiers died uh, during World War I. They've become a symbol to commemorate those who died, and their colour is also a very stark reminder of how they sacrificed their lives as well. So I'm going to read the poem now for you. Um, see how much you can understand on the first reading, but afterwards I am going to go through it all anyway. So, Poppies. Three days before Armistice Sunday, and Poppies had already been placed on individual war graves. Before you left, I pinned one onto your lapel, crimped petals, spasms of red paper, disrupting a blockade of yellow bias binding around your blazer. Sellotape bandaged around my hand, I rounded up as many white cat hairs as I could, smoothed down your shirt's upturned collar, steeled the softening of my face. I wanted to graze my nose against the tip of your nose, play at being Eskimos like we did when you were little. I resisted the impulse to run my fingers through the gelled blackthorns of your hair. All my words flattened, rolled, turned into felt, slowly melting, I was brave as I walked with you to the front door, threw it open, the world overflowing like a treasure chest. A split second and you were away, intoxicated. After you'd gone, I went into your bedroom, released a songbird from its cage. Later, a single dove flew from the pear tree, and this is where it has led me, skirting the churchyard walls, my stomach busy making tucks, darts, pleats hatless, without a winter coat or reinforcement of scarf, gloves. On reaching the top of the hill, I traced the inscriptions on the war memorial, leaned against it like a wishbone. The dove pulled freely against the sky, an ornamental stitch. I listened, hoping to hear your playground voice catching on the wind. So now we'll start going by uh, through the poem bit by bit, making sure that we don't leave any little moments that might be significant. So three days before our Mr. Sunday and poppies had already been placed on individual war graves. So the speaker here is in a graveyard. Stating individual graves is interesting because it takes the national respect of our Mr. Sunday and it makes it a bit more personal. That might become more important later on. So an image there to represent what she's looking at. And then later in the stanza, before you left, I pinned one onto your lapel, crimped petals, spasms of, red, of paper red, disrupting a blockade of yellow bias binding around your blazer. We learn some more things in this part. So firstly, we've got you and I. I is the speaker. We know who the speaker is, the mother. And you, she's talking to her son about her son, though he isn't actually there with her. The phrase before you left is very important. This poem has a series of discourse markers that let us know when things are happening. And that's very important um, if you're going to understand the poem. So it takes this, this one, before you left, it takes us back into the speaker's memories. So we're going back now. 
Um, and that is something that continues all the way through the poem. When it comes to words that you might not fully understand, like lapel, um, blockade, yellow bias binding around your blazer, essentially what she's doing is she's placing a poppy onto his uniform. So he's just about to leave. And on his uniform, she's placed a poppy and the poppy has gone over a little strip of yellow that was on his uniform. That's all it means, essentially. There are some interesting uses of language and structure there from Weir, but we'll go into that later. Sellotape bandaged around my hand, I rounded up as many cat hairs as I could. Smooth down your shirt's upturned collar, steal the softening of my face. This is quite interesting because as he was ready to leave for duty, she was still mothering him, fixing the little imperfections like his collar and removing cat hairs. These are all very ordinary everyday problems, something that I think she kind of enjoyed having even just for that minute. But she was stealing the softening of her face. This is an, in, an, an important early sign that the speaker is struggling to cope during this moment. For her son, she changed her expression. She didn't want to show the fear that she felt to him. And then we move on. I wanted to graze my nose against the tip of your nose, play it being Eskimos like we did when you were little. So an Eskimo kiss reference there. I resisted the impulse to run my fingers through the gel black thorns of your hair. All my words flattened, rolled, turned into felt. What we've got with the Eskimo thing there is that as he's about to leave, memories seem to fill her mind. She feels the urge to treat him like she did when he was little, before he felt, bef sorry, before she felt the fear that she feels now. She wanted to give him an Eskimo kiss and stroke his hair neither of which would be appropriate in the moment she now finds herself in. When it comes to all my words, flattened, rolled, turned to felt, there's lots of different ways in of interpreting this, such as um, her words getting stuck in her mouth, uh, like, like felt would do. Um, but basically what she's saying is that she couldn't find the right words to say. So she's finding it very difficult, this whole situation of being stood with her son, um, who's about to leave her to go away to war. I was brave as I walked with you to the front door, threw it open, the world overflowing like a treasure chest. A split second and you were away, intoxicated. So in this section then, she remembers the intense moment of walking with her son to the door. And the door almost acts like a symbol for the end of his life with her and the beginning of his life with the military. We'll go into that more later. A split second and you were away intoxicated. These lines indicate that for the son, it's not the same. He seems excited, complete, completely contrasting against her fear. After you'd gone, I went into your bedroom, released a songbird from its cage. Later, a single dove flew from the pear tree, and this is where it has led me. Skirting the churchyard walls, my stomach busy, making tucks, darts, pleats, hatless, without a winter coat or reinforcements of scarf, gloves. So again, discourse marker here, after you'd gone and later. Now the next phase of the poem has begun. It's the speaker on her own afterwards. It's interesting that she says that she's released a songbird from its cage. This is most likely metaphorical for her son's new freedom. There are alternatives which we'll look at later. And then she says that it's brought her this dove, um, this dove for, uh, which flew from the pear tree, has brought her to the church, church walls. Okay, so she's going around a, a graveyard. Whether you choose to believe that this dove is real or not, we'll go into later. So the speaker seems to be saying that she followed the dove there. She walks through these graveyard, this graveyard then, feeling intensely anxious. And when she says without a winter coat or reinforcements of scarf and gloves, that is important. It's another sign that she just isn't coping. She left the house without appropriate clothing for the cold. And then towards the end of the poem, on reaching the top of the hill, I traced the inscriptions of on the war memorial, leaned against it like a wishbone. The dove pulled freely against the sky, an ornamental stitch. I listened, hoping to hear your playground voice catching on the wind. 
So the poem ends with the speaker stood on top of the hill in the graveyard next to the war memorial. Um, she seems to spend a lot of time there thinking and she leans against the memorial as she remembers her son's youth. And the end of the poem is really important. She remembers the carefree way he used to sound when he was only a child. She longs for that time. She yearns for it. Based on that then, if that's what the poem's about, a mother's loss, a mother's feelings, a mother's reactions to her son leaving for, the, for war, what do we learn about life, human nature? So I suppose we learn that conflict brings suffering, even to those who do not fight. So it's an interesting perspective, the mother's perspective. It creates great psychological trauma. This, we, see, we see a character in this speaker who is really struggling it's another example of duty and patriotism overriding family and relationships, the way that we see that he is excited, he can't wait to go. It's just a land of opportunity for him against his mother's terror. It highlights the comfort of memories as well. She visits these memories as a way of comforting herself, as a way of remembering what he used to be like, a time when she could control his safety. And naturally it highlights the tragedy of war, the fact that it's called poppies, the fact that it's in a graveyard, she's at a war memorial, all that kind of stuff, the tragedy that war brings with it, the mass death. Something that people always consider after reading this poem is, did her son die? It's never clear, it's deliberately not clear actually. There are lots and lots of reasons that you could put forward for whether he's dead or not dead. I'm just gonna quickly go through a couple um, but I'm not going to spend too long on this because I think the analysis of themes later will illuminate it a little bit more. Plus, it's really down to your own interpretation. There's no right or wrong answer with this. So the discourse markers in the poem before you left, after you left and later, they can, if you choose to see them this way, they can all indicate that the sun leaves on the same day that the speaker visits the graveyard. So. If you like, most of this poem is in one day. He leaves, then she goes upstairs. She um, then goes straight to the graveyard because that's how she's processing the information, the difficult situation. That's possible. This means that all the memories of intimacy between the mother and son are because she's going to miss him being close and primarily safe. That would make sense. That explains a lot of her behavior. If her son has only just left, her sense of loss is him physically leaving, and her fear is the anticipation of his death. If we believe then that her son is alive, then we can still explain the theme of fear um, as being anticipation. What I mean by that is the waiting, the waiting for the possibility that he will um, die. Alternatively though, you could also say that after you'd gone, refers to long ago in the past. This could be a long time after. That She could be remembering this a long time after it actually happened. The poem also begins with her noticing that poppies have been placed in war graves. She thinks about the rest of the poem because she's already in a graveyard. So just to put that into context again, the first three lines, she's in a graveyard already. She's noticed the things about the graveyard, the poppies on graves. And then she tells us about when her son left. That does seem to set up the idea that um, he died. And this is where it has led me also suggest that her experience at home has unconsciously drawn her to him at his graveyard. So when she went upstairs and then she found herself in the, in the graveyard afterwards, it's almost like she's been drawn to him. So this word ambiguity or ambiguous, it means basically if something's deliberately unclear. Weir makes it deliberately unclear what happened to the son of the speaker. And there's, there's different reasons for this. And I think it ties into the meaning of the poem itself. First of all, it could be to represent the doubt experienced by mothers of soldiers, this constant fear of what's happening. Where is he? Is he OK? Um, is she doing this? Is she doing that? Is he going to make it back? Secondly, to represent the speaker's lack of clarity when she's trying to recover from her son leaving. She 
as soon as he leaves, does not seem to be in her right state of mind, not looking after herself, not bringing a coat with her. Um, it represents then this lack of clarity in her mind, whether or not he is or isn't um, still alive. So themes then, the big ideas in this poem, memories certainly seem like they're very important. So does fear. And this idea of loss versus freedom, her perspective versus his perspective. So what I'm going to do is have a look at quotes that represent these themes and how they're presented, how you'd be able to zoom in on them as well. So we'll start with memories. So this quote here about um, fairly early on, it's in the first stanza of her looking after him, basically uh, pinning the poppy to his blazer. One of the most recent memories she has is how she was still helping her son moments before he left. She pins a poppy onto his uniform, which could be a metaphor for the respect that she has for soldiers, but it could also be how she may have to remember him one day like the others who fell. You could even call it foreshadowing in that sense. A bit about the yellow bias, so the, the kind of yellow trim on his blazer. The amount of alliteration here, disrupting a blockade of yellow bias binding around his blazer. The amount of alliteration here on these lines could represent crying, nerves, fear, resentment, um, all of these different emotions. But as a mother, she still held all of that back. Next, the bit about the Eskimo kiss. This memory that she has about grazing her nose against his is extremely innocent, but it's also very intimate. It's that kind of connection between mother and son when, when the child is still young. These are concepts that she really longs for now, but she can't have them anymore. Later on, when it says, being Eskimos like we did when you were little, little has a full stop next to it. That's sejura because it's a pause within a line. So the sejura after little emphasizes how that stage of his life, when he was little, is over. We get a sense of finality here um, from the sejura. So references to his age and size all seem to convey a longing for a time when she was in control, when she could keep him safe, and when she could look after him. She can't do that anymore. Finally, we've got the end of the poem. I listened hoping to hear your playground voice catching on the wind. The way that she is listening and hoping demonstrates the impossibility of this desire. It illustrates her desperation. She, she would do anything for it back. And it's interesting how she phrases it as his playground voice. So playground here represents the innocence of youth, where children play and they're carefree. And that contrasts against what his actual future is, um, how the mother can do nothing about it. And the way that she phrases it is catching on the wind. The wind here, you could also say, is a metaphor for how elusive and impossible to catch her hopes are. By elusive, I mean difficult. Uh, it, it, it's difficult to catch. So fear. So the bit about the sellotape again is very interesting phrasing because she says that um, sellotape was bandaged around her hand. She means wrapped. It was wrapped around her hands as she was getting the cat hairs off. But she says bandaged. So this is an interesting choice of a verb. Bandages are used to help heal injuries. She feels wounded by him leaving then, you could say. But it's disguised by her caring for him and his appearance. She also says cat hairs, along with lots of other ordinary, everyday references. And what that does is it helps us understand that this could be anyone, any mother, any parent. If we expand it beyond this one person's experience, remember Jane Weir wanted to explore what it must be like for mothers of soldiers. But we can open that up to parents of soldiers. We don't have to just think about now, we can think about all parents ever that have lost their children to war. Next, steeled the softening of my face. So this verb, steeled, connotes strength, obviously, because we associate it with, with metal. 
She is hardening her face then to keep her true feelings from her son. And this conveys both the maternal love that she feels and the sacrifices that mothers make for the sake of their children. Maternal just means motherly. I was brave as I walked with you to the front door. So the, what's really interesting here is the phrase, I was brave. It seems out of place. It's a phrase that would normally be associated with the child in a mother-child relationship. I was brave. And the fact that she's using it about herself shows how helpless and desperate she feels in this moment. She has had that role of protector, carer, taken away from her. And now she's having to, to be the one who puts a brave face on. The front door itself could be a symbol or metaphor. Um, it could be for the journey through life and the opportunities that her son has in front of him. He opens it up and steps forward and he has this new life. But to her, that door is shutting and she's on the other side of it. It's the end of an era for her. And again, that's something that she seems terrified of. That's why she seems to be uh, focusing on how brave she was in that moment, because she was having to hold back her fear, her sadness. So my stomach busy making tucks, darts, pleats, hatless without a winter coat or reinforcements of scarf or gloves. Some really interesting verb choices here again. Tucks, darts, pleats. These are all quite militaristic. They all sound like a soldier's actions or what planes do, where they kind of fold or level out or jump. There is a bit of an irony here then that she's using this militaristic language to describe how her stomach is, is she's, she's got butterflies in her stomach, she's nervous, she's, she's anxious rather. Um, there is a bit of irony here because she's using conflict to describe how she feels and she's not the one who's actually going to the physical conflict. But what it's saying then is that she's feeling just as much turmoil as a soldier. There's more irony in the next line when she says that she didn't have the reinforcements of a winter coat, scarf or gloves when she went out. When she left then, she didn't bring anything with her that was appropriate. Now that her son's gone, she stopped looking after herself. Her psychological trauma is overriding her physical needs. So just to explain that, We've seen throughout the poem that she was looking after her son, that she was being responsible. As soon as he leaves, she's not looking after herself. And that emphasizes again the effect that it's had on her, how she's struggling to cope so much that instead of looking after herself and her child, she's no, no longer looking after neither of them. And then finally, loss and freedom. Poppies had already been placed on individual war graves. So we're returning to the beginning of the poem again now. So, poppies symbolise love, remembrance and tragedy. Now the adverb already is interesting here because it shows how those who remember the fallen are early to pay their respects. This is something that the speaker notices early on, that people who have lost are paying respects early on. And it's interesting that because the speaker notices each individual grave as well. And this is all perhaps a reflection of how she feels personally affected, just like all the others, by what has happened to her son. She's one of them now. She's one of the people that is personally affected. More so if you choose to believe that he's died. Contrasting against that, we have the way that the son experiences his journey to um, leave the ha house and go off um, to war. Threw it open, the world overflowing like a treasure chest. A split second and you were away, intoxicated. So it's interesting that he says overflowing like a treasure chest. To her son, this is a huge opportunity. The beginning of something exciting. It's overflowing with possibilities, things that he could never have imagined before. And the simile like a treasure chest conveys how precious and valuable this moment is to him. That couldn't contrast more to how she, how she feels about it. And intoxicated as well, normally associate that with being drunk. It doesn't necessarily actually mean that now. In fact, it definitely wouldn't mean that he, he wouldn't be drunk, actually. He would be more drunk on his excitement. So the speaker notices the difference in her fear of loss and how her son seems to be almost caught up in it. And then she 
once he leaves, she goes up to his bedroom. And there's some quite complex metaphors at play here. I went into your bedroom, released a songbird from its cage. Later, a single dove flew from the pear tree. And this is where it has led me. Before I go into this, I want to just confirm again that whether you think the son is dead or alive is perfectly valid either way. There's plenty of evidence for each case. It's all down to your personal interpretation. So it's interesting then that she goes immediately to his bedroom. You could say that the bedroom is a symbol for his life with her under her roof. It was his room in her house. She goes there straight away because he's not there anymore, symbolizing his development, his growth, his, his leaving. Songbird from its cage, a metaphor here for her son being set free from being a child, from being under her responsibility. He can fly out into the world now to make his own decisions, just like a bird released from a cage. However, you could also flip it and say that the songbird and cage metaphor is actually to represent her going upstairs and allowing herself to cry, hence song bird representing the noise of her uh, her crying either way is fine this next bit doves represent peace and they're also very often used um when mourning at funerals and things like that to symbolize grief pear trees symbolize long life growth if we put these two together then and said and when she's saying a later a single dove flew from the pear tree is that another metaphor to convey how her son has come to his peace too early if so does that mean that he is actually dead and this is where it has led me so there's different ways you can read this if you choose you can read this to mean that there was literally a dove and she followed it because of its connotations and it took her to the graveyard. That is absolutely valid as one way of seeing the poem. However, you could also see it the metaphorical way, as I've just said, the idea that he did die and the reason that it led her to the grave is because that's where his body is. I traced the inscriptions on the war memorial, leaned against it like a wishbone. So it's interesting that she's tracing these inscriptions, these words. Um, so she's feeling them out. She's reading them. Shows that they're clearly very important to her. And then the idea that she leaned against it like a wishbone. There's loads of ideas for this. But essentially, wishbones we associate with luck, making wishes, obviously. They're also very fragile and weak, easy to snap. So this simile, it represents the fragility of herself of the memorial, of the whole situation. There's lots of different ideas you could have here. It also represents her desires and wishes to have her son back. So that was the poem. I blasted through that very quickly. There's lots of other ideas that I didn't manage to touch on. If you wanted to add more or you didn't quite understand it, we've got these resources here. We've got the English Revision Drive, which is always getting things added to it. More videos for other poems as well. And then you've got your teachers, who are the greatest resource that you're going to have. And finally, you've got useful websites like Genius, Sparknote, Schmoop, BBC Bite Size, and YouTube, all of which have got really good resources on there. Thank you for listening. I hope it was useful. Cheers.